Welcome to the lecture on Chapter 22, Section 3, Hoover Struggles with the Depression. Uh, the objective today is to learn about President Hoover's response to the Great Depression, and the essential question we'll be asking ourselves is why did the Hoover administration lose public support? So, uh, in the last section we talked about how the Great Depression is impacting urban areas and the farmers, now it's impacting families, men, and women both, and minorities. Now we're going to examine in this section how did President Hoover react to all of this, and how did, what effect did his reaction have on the Depression. President Hoover was a Republican. He was a fiscal conservative. Uh, he was a former engineer, but he was also very intelligent about financial matters. So he seemed like the perfect guy to handle a, uh, the stock market crash in the beginning of the Great Depression. But in retrospect, he really wasn't at all. Um, President Hoover believed depressions were a normal, healthy part of the business cycle and that the depression will correct itself. Throughout most of fiscal history, this would have been correct. But the Great Depression and the stock market crash of 1929 was unprecedented in American history. And it was far, far worse than most depressions or panics of the past. President Hoover believed that <clears throat> he, he was a compassionate guy, but he believed the government's job was to figure out a compromise between business and labor and to help fix problems and find solutions. He didn't believe it was the government's job to provide a solution. He thought this was creating a precedent in American history that could never be uh, undone. He would be turning over a stone that could not be turned back. And he was really afraid of this. In addition to this, he believed uh, wholeheartedly in rugged individualism and voluntary action. The fact that we are responsible individually for our own fate. And if we want to take action, we should do it ourselves, not rely on someone else to do it for us. He believed the government should do as little as possible and that the people should come in to find their own solutions to their problems and should... Uh, you know, get out of this depression on their own. While this is an honorable, principled stance to take, uh, it was not the correct stance to take, at least Hoover began to realize, and the American public believed, it was not the correct stance to take this time in this depression, because this one was far worse than any that anyone had ever seen. And while Hoover eventually starts to come around to the idea of government involvement in society, he still stands firm on this idea of no direct relief. He doesn't want the government going directly to the people and basically giving them handouts, providing them with relief directly. And this will be the downfall of President Hoover. So, one issue that Hoover realizes is over time, this depression, like most depressions or uh, downturns in the uh, stock market, this one doesn't fix itself. And he begins to struggle with that reality. He asks businesses to voluntarily hold wages and employment. And he begins to take steps to try to curtail uh, the downward spiral of the economy. But he's not able to. The economy continues to collapse, and the people voice their displeasure with Hoover and the Republicans in the election of 1930, the midterm election, in which the Democrats win a majority in both the House of Representatives and the Senate. Farmers become furious over the falling crop prices that continue into 1930 and 1931. They declare a farm holiday in which they just refuse to work for a day. They're hoping if they withhold farm products from the public, the prices will start to go up and normalize again. But that's just not the case. And so farmers start rioting and destroying crops, and they demand President Hoover do something about this. Starvation and homelessness haunts the United States, and naturally, just like when things are going great, the president gets all the credit, when things are going poorly, the president gets most of the blame, and people began to look towards President Hoover. Like I mentioned last chapter, or last section, these shanty towns popping up all over cities were nicknamed Hoover Flags. Uh, the newspapers homeless people would use to try and wrap themselves in to keep them warm were nicknamed Hoover Blankets. 
People would take their pockets and pull them out like this and show that they have no money and call them Hoover flags. So it isn't hard to figure out who is getting most of the blame for this and who needs to take action if he wants to save his political future. That's President Herbert Hoover. And he does begin to take action. But what he does, he does too little and he does too late. Sticking to his conservative principles, he does not want to provide direct relief. But he also realizes what he's done so far has not helped, and he needs to do more. So he authorized public works projects to build dams, bridges, and roads. Famously, uh, the Hoover Dam is built, which was really named the Boulder Dam um, at the time. The Hoover Dam, very famous, um, and this was built during this time. There were two major pieces of legislation passed during this time, uh, the last couple of years of Hoover's presidency, to try to counteract the Great Depression. The first one passed in 1932, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. This gave emergency financing to banks, railroad companies, railroads, and other large businesses. And then he also passed the Federal Home Loan Bank Act, which lowered mortgage rates for homeowners hoping that they can hold on to their homes um, so they don't lose their homes uh, and, uh, and also allow farmers to refinance their loans so they didn't uh, lose their land. Hoover was trying to prevent homeowners and farm owners from um, losing their mortgages and losing their homes and having to file for bankruptcy or foreclosure. That's the word that I've been looking for. Uh, have, having to foreclose on their property. And because the more people that do that, the more uh, the spiral continues to spin and the worse the economy really begins to get. As you can see, President Hoover did try to do something. This is actually unprecedented in American history. Oftentimes, Hoover is blamed for just sitting back and twiddling his thumbs and allowing America to fail. But you have to remember, this depression is unprecedented. No president was prepared for this economic collapse, so it's hard to blame Hoover for the little action he took. The one criticism you can say is the action he did take was too little and too late. And this principled idea of direct relief, while great in theory, didn't really work out in reality. And the biggest criticism, even at the time, is that yes, you're providing unprecedented relief for society, but you're not actually giving it to average citizens. It's not trickling down to anyone. You're just bailing out the big businesses. And of course, this is going to hurt him because he's going to have to run for re-election and he's going to end up really harming his chances in re-election. But speaking of harming his chances in re-election, uh, the proverbial nail in Hoover's coffin when he runs for re-election is the gassing of the bonus army. The final year of Hoover's presidency, 10 to 20,000 veterans from World War I march on Washington, D.C. Now, in 1924, a bill was passed giving these veterans um, a stipend of somewhere around $500, but it said it, it wouldn't be paid out until 1945. You know, the veterans accepted it, figuring it was better than nothing. And it wasn't a huge deal that wouldn't be paid out until 1945, until the economy collapsed. And these veterans were out of jobs and couldn't feed their families. They marched on Washington, demanding that their bonus be paid now, not 15 years or 13 years from now. And Hoover, respecting the veterans for their service in World War I, gave them the right to peacefully assemble and said that they could assemble in Washington, D.C. while they were protesting and demanding their bonus. He even provided them with food and so much clothing uh, in order to continue to protest. And the Patman Bill, which was the bill proposed to Congress to give them their relief, was proposed to Congress and rejected. And Hoover said, look, your efforts were honorable, but you lost. Congress, your representatives rejected the bill. Now it's time to go home. And while most of the army went home, about one to 2,000 men, re women and children, refused to go home. And Hoover, feeling like he had no other choice, called in 1,000 uh, soldiers from the army, gassed the 
bonus army, the, the veterans of World War I, burned all of their belongings, an 11-month-old child died, an 8-month-old child, 8-year-old child became extremely sick. Uh, there were images of them uh, burning all of the property of the bonus army, um, of people becoming injured, a couple people were shot. And while you could say it was their own fault for not leaving in the first place, that doesn't matter. Hoover looked terrible in all of this. And this is basically the end of President Hoover. And FDR even remarked that the gassing of the bonus army basically won the election for him because it made Hoover look so bad. In Chapter 23, we're going to be introducing a new president in the election of 1932. And that's FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the Democrat. And he will have a totally different approach to this Great Depression than President Hoover did. And we'll get into the effect and impact FDR had on the society in his four terms as president. Like always, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask your history.